Hey, this is Clay, CPAP My Way, CPAPMyWay.com. Wanted to bring you the uh, latest information on the uh, Philips recall. Specifically, we've had some really good uh, updates from Philips directly and um, wanted to share that with you. Um, specifically, they have given us some in interesting uh, statistics about um, how they're doing so far and how many people have registered, things like that. Um, and then secondarily, they sent us some really good uh, clinical information about the recall. Basically, you know, what led to the recall and the facts uh, associated with the lab studies that they've done. So I really wanted to pass that along to you. Obviously, you're going to um, realize in watching this that I'm not a doctor or a chemist. So please don't hold me responsible for anything I, I mispronounce here. Uh, there's a lot of long words. Um, but it really is good information. I'm going to throw up some screenshots here on the screen. If you want to read them, just hit pause real quick and uh, read through their verbiage exactly so that you can see it uh, straight from their mouth. Um, but I'll summarize it for you. Um, that way you can kind of get an overview um, and, uh, and see what I'm seeing directly from Philips. Um, so first, in, uh, first up is statistics from Philips. Um, from what they've said, about 250,000 people have registered so far for the recall. Um, you know, they made like four point something million of these devices, so 250,000 is a pretty low number in my opinion, and um, I know they were gearing up to make up to a quarter million units per month manufacturing-wise. So, you know, if it's if the recalls registration is going to trickle in like this from customers, maybe they'll be able to keep up a little better than I anticipated up front. I'm hopeful, in some ways, that that's the case. Um, so that that's in encouraging to me. The other thing of really big note is that we had our first customer receive um, correspondence from Philips regarding the replacement of their dream station. That is um, pretty cool to hear. <laughs> so, uh, and also should be encouraging to those of you out there that have registered. If you haven't registered, get registered. I'll have the link in the description. Get that done so you're on the list. Um, Philips has said that they've also geared all of their manufacturing in the sleep and respiratory category to deal directly with this recall. So. All hands on deck are associated to the recall. They're not distributing their CPAPs for sale right now. Everything is geared to resolving the recall. Um, they've also allocated 500 agents to help with registrations and things of that nature so that they can make the customer experience a little bit better. I've heard ups and downs on both of those from our customers. Um, and they are still waiting on the FDA and Health Canada to um, authorize that new foam that they've got for the repair of uh, of the dream stations that are going to have to be repaired, so like your bypass dream station goes, the ones that don't have a, um, uh, well, really the dream station two is the only um, thing that they have that'll they can swap out bad units with. So if you have a bypass or a dream station go, it's going to have to be repaired, and they're waiting on the uh, the foam. Those are the updates from uh, from Phillips on the stats. Um, the other thing of of a lot more interest here to me are um, their update on the uh, foam degradation and the chemical emission issues. Um, those are two huge issues that we're hearing a lot of questions about and we have not had a lot of answers. This should give you some answers, which is kind of cool. Um, one thing or, or two things up front that I'm noticing about this is that the chemical issue, uh, the chemical emission issue seems to be mainly an upfront issue and seemingly from what they're saying here was an issue for people within the first few days of using the device. So you can look at the information I put up here as, as to what you think about that. Um, and the foam degradation seems to be a long-term issue. Obviously that kind of goes without saying because that's gonna happen over time. But uh, some interesting things about the size of it, bacteria filters, things like that as well here as we go through it. Um, on the foam degradation side, um, they're referencing a process called hydrolysis is what's causing the foam um, uh, to break down, that is. And uh, obviously the concern is that as it breaks down, it's going to be blown into the airway and it could be consumed or inhaled. Um, this particular foam is widely used uh, for sound dampening purposes in a lot of industries. So this is not something that is only used by Philips here in these CPAPs. There was a couple of different byproducts from the uh, humid aging experiment. I'm just going to put them up here in front of you, but I'm going to use the abbreviation. So the first was DEG, the second was TDA, the third was TDI. Um, and out of those, uh, when they did the lab analysis, they positively confirmed the presence of DEG 
but they were not able to positively confirm the presence of TDA or TDI. Um, with all that being said, it looks like their worst case scenario, as far as somebody uh, dealing with those particular things, is going to be irritation to the skin, eye, and respiratory tract, inflammation response, headache, asthma, adverse effects to other organs, kidneys, and liver, and possible toxic and carcinogenic effects, as well as foam particles may cause irritation and airway inflammation. This may be particularly important for patients with underlying lung diseases or reduced cardiopulmonary reserve. Um, we have heard in the past that people finding little black particles, especially in their humidifier chamber, like in the water, floating around in the water. And um, when I say we've heard that, I mean like one time, I don't know, maybe out of a thousand, one out of a thousand customers we've heard maybe, I, I can only think of maybe a handful of times I've heard that from somebody and we you know, went through the RMA process. I'm sure that's what led to some of this is uh, other people having the same issue. Um, We've never heard of anybody inhaling or ingesting any of these things, but um, obviously that is uh, something that could happen. Um, Phillips also uh, had reports of headache, upper airway irritation, cough, chest pressure, and sinus infection, but it's important to note that they say there's been no patient death reported to date. Um, they also know that a lot of users may not actually uh, report this to Phillips, so the 0.03% um, uh, issue rate that they are uh, referencing obviously maybe a little under underscored um, the other thing of note that they put here is that based on the test data and information available Phillips believes that most degraded foam particles are too big to be deeply inhaled uh, it also goes into talk about the size um, most of the particulates are greater than eight micrometers and unlikely to penetrate the deep lung tissue it, uh, it has to be smaller particles to get deep into the lungs, so uh, less than one to three micrometers can uh, diffuse deeply into the lung tissue and deposit into the alveoli. Um, during tests performed by an outside lab on the foam, the smallest particle size was 2.69 micrometers uh, on that foam degradation. So with that being said, um, they reference bacteria filters and that bacteria filters indicated 99.97 effectiveness on particulate sizes of 0.3 micrometers or greater. Um, so they think that should be a pretty decent option for those. They're recommending it specifically for people on Trilogy that can't get a different ventilator. A Trilogy is a ventilator uh, for those of you out there who don't know what that is and it's part of the recall. Um, but if you're concerned about the foam coming through, that bacteria filter should do a decent job of catching something um, of 0.3 micrometers or larger. Um, so you know, I thought that was really good information um, on on the foam, at least you know what they found in per, uh, in detail um, that led to the recall for sure. The next thing are the uh, chemical emissions. So um, that was something that a lot of people were pretty seriously concerned about because it was kind of vague. People were talking about off gassing and cancer causing things, and um, you know that's obviously a concern, but it looks like from what they're saying here there are two compounds that they're concerned about i'm going to put those on the screen because there's no chance of me pronouncing these correctly um the first one um i'll try here dimethyl diazine dissipates to below detectable levels after the first 24 hours of use on a new device that was really interesting um the second i'm not even going to try tapers off during the first initial days of use on a new device so based upon that information, I'm going to say that if you've been on CPAP for a month or two or this Dream Station for a month or two, you're past the point where they're detecting these levels of the chemical emissions. I'm just passing along the information to you and I know a lot of people are very skeptical about um, that sort of information coming from the people that are doing the recall and I completely understand that, but it is good information nonetheless. Um, I, I will say that they don't have a ton of information about either two of those um, uh, gas compounds that they're, that they're citing here, but I'll put the information up here in front of you now. They talk of, I'm gonna use this word here, that, that there's not any mutagenicity alerts on either of those based upon the information at hand here. 
I don't know if that's a big good thing or, or not, but um, it's definitely something of note. So with all that information, Phillips is considering the following as uh, possible risks for a reasonable worst case scenario um, for those chemical, um, uh, those chemical emissions. Headache, dizziness, irritation to eyes, nose, respiratory tract, and skin, hypersensitivity, nausea slash vomiting, and possible toxic and carcinogenic, carcinogenic effects. These compounds may cause irritation and airway inflammation, and this may be particularly important for patients with underlying lung diseases or reduced cardiopulmonary reserve. Again, no reports regarding patient impact related to chemicals. So that's also a really interesting thing to hear that they've had no reports regarding the impact to this particular chemical emission. Um, they've cited all of the uh, studies and notes and references here. I'll put those on the screen as well. Again, hit pause if you want to look these up in detail. Um, and uh, obviously, if you want me to put anything up here or you'd like something clarified, just comment in the information below. But uh, we found all that information to be really um, interesting, uh, at the very least, and, uh, and it definitely is helpful as far as how we're going to speak to people you know, regarding the recall. So we thought we'd pass it along to you. We hope you found the information helpful. As always, hit us with a like if, if you found it helpful and share, as well as um, comment with any questions, and we'll do our best to, um, to find the answers for you. So thanks again, and uh, we've got another video coming out here soon. Uh, featuring what the American Academy of Sleep Medicine and the European Respiratory Society are recommending in reference to this recall, as well as a really cool flow chart that was developed here locally um, for, um, for doctors to help patients decide for what's next. So we'll share that with you next. Um, so thanks for watching.